Right, hello everybody. Um, welcome to this webinar for Open Access Australasia. Um, my name is Ginny Barber. I'm the director of Open Access Australasia, and I'm going to be uh, uh, just emceeing this session today. Um, uh, just the usual practicalities. If you wouldn't mind having a quick look at this, keep your um, keep your microphone muted as we go through. It, it's often better to keep your your camera off, just in case people have bandwidth um, issues. You're very welcome to type into the chat or to put some questions in there um, and I will read out some questions at the end for both Angus and Martin and we will aim to um, finish on or before uh, the hour. Uh, so um, just before I go into what Open Access Australasia is, I would just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that I'm on today. Um, I am in Mianjin in Brisbane, so the Turrbal and Yagara people are the traditional custodians of the land that I'm on in southeast Queensland. UNSW is Aust Open Access Australasia's um, host institution, and it's located on Bedigal and Gadigal lands of the Eora Nation in the Sydney Basin. And I would like to pay my respects to elders past and present and to extend res that respect to any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander people who are here today and to recognise the important role um, that they have always played in teaching and learning and the dissemination of knowledge. So um, if you're not fully with, uh, familiar with Open Access Australasia, this is us. We're an organisation of 31 universities across Australia and outer in New Zealand. Um, we also have seven affiliate organisations and our newest ones, I'm delighted to say, are the Australian Citizen Science Association, National and State Libraries Australasia. Um, we have a, a very diverse um, uh, uh, executive committee which is drawn ac from across Australia and New Zealand which is chaired by uh, Kim Terry from the Auckland University of Technology. Um, oh, I've missed one. So let me just quickly get our principles really tie into what we're going to talk about today so they're around equity and scholarly communication and in particular we support a diverse ecosystem of open access approaches and that's why we're so keen to support initiatives such as SCOS. Um, a bit about how we do what we do. We work on advocacy, collaboration nationally and globally. We do a lot of uh, raising awareness, including through um, initiatives such as webinars like this. And we um, uh, work towards building capacity and open access and op open science across Australia and out here in New Zealand. So um, I'm really delighted that our speakers today will be Martin Borsha, who is chair of the SCOS board. Um, and also uh, un librarian at UNSW and was previously the chair of Open Access Australasia. Um, and Angus Cook, who's the Director of Content Procurement at CORE. So I'll pass over to uh, Martin now to kick off the presentation, and then we will come to questions after both Martin and Angus have spoken. Thanks very much, Jenny. Good morning, everybody, and also a good afternoon. Uh, I'm joining you from uh, the Sunshine Coast, so I'd like to acknowledge also the Gabi Gabi people, um, whose lands I'm living and working on today. Uh, so I'm just going to share my slides for you. How's that looking? Pretty good, great. So I think a few of you may recall that this may actually be the fourth of these presentations. We've been doing them annually um, and they align with the, and they also align with like the SCOS um, in the each year that we do a funding round. So uh, this really um, is to give you information and to ask you please uh, to also work with us um, and also work with CORE um, to give uh, funding uh, to round four infrastructure. So um, I will give some um, of the overview again, but we'll spend half the time um, looking at round four infrastructure. So uh, SCOS um, has been around now for quite a long time, in fact. Um, we're sort of into the sixth or seventh year. Um, I've also been fortunate um, to be the call representative um, also on the board of SCOS. And I've also been fortunate enough uh, to be the chair um, also of the board of SCOS. So I guess I've got those two hats when I'm talking to you today. Um, and we have a program um, where we reach out um, worldwide uh, to libraries and governments and, and also to funders um, to explain about the need um, 
and also where the benefits uh, of the option are to fund open science and open access infrastructure, um, which we can all use and benefit from. Um, and it provides another, um, and then it provides another way or an ecosystem uh, for researchers uh, to work and to collaborate. So the background is um, working with working like that with Sparker Europe, um, which is the lead organization for SCOS, um, which is really run as a project without an end date. Um, the need is really that many of these open science and open access infrastructure were started as projects, um, and they really only had funding for a period of time. And that then leads them to having a sustainability issue. Um, it can arise through lack of funding. It can rise uh, through a need uh, to overhaul their infrastructure. Also, um, as they work with more researchers, uh, they tend to gain a lot more users. And so they have to also build a resilience of also of the infrastructure. And of course, the needs change. So, you know, they may want to go global or work with a different range of subject areas. Um, often often um, they have to also change the technology that they're using um, and add a range of new services. But what we're trying to address is the risk that they don't um, have the funding uh, to uh, do all of those things. Um, and so it really, um, it's trying to address a risk um, um, where the service is not able to continue or it's not able to meet the demands. And um, that's what we're talking about. Um, this paper here, uh, which was a 2020 paper, with the reference at the bottom there, um, was looking um, at the ecosystem of open science um, and open access infrastructure, um, mainly looking at Europe, but you know, there's a lot of tools here that are used in a global sense. And it just gives you um, an idea there of the importance of interoperability and that they're each, each of those are doing a function and you piece them together. Um, so I want people to think about that we need the diversity in the open science, open access infrastructure space in the same way that we have the diversity in the publishing space as well with all, with all of other commercial publishers. Um, also that same paper from 2020, like that with Fikra, um, was looking, um, was really looking at the viability of open science infrastructure in the short and medium term and found that a lot of them um, were at risk in the short term. So this kind of program um, is designed to help address that. So SCOS, uh, what we do um, is that we're a community led and governed group uh, with representatives from many parts of the world. Um, we do a process um, where we do an EOI, um, which goes out to infrastructure. Um, and they give a proposal using our template. Um, and then we vet those. And then we have a few stages until we reach a small group of infrastructure that we want to support each year in a round. Um, and then we contract with them and then we help them uh, to do crowdfunding. Um, we also work with them as a family of SCOS members and um, we work uh, to help improve their processes and their governance as well um, and we do a work plan with them over three years um, and then an important part is that we also do a report is that each of them will do a report for the SCOS board uh, which is a demonstration of how they're meeting their work plan goals um, using the funding which is provided from SCOS uh, donors. So we focus very much on governance and you know, we help them with marketing and also with technology and all sorts of things. So um, just also a few words about SCOS and governance. We have a board, an advisory group, and an executive group. Um, all of these people, except for Spark Europe people, um, are on these groups um, in their own time. Um, and it's really important to us to have a diversity um, of, of views. So, uh, we try to uh, bring people together from different groups. Um, these are the member organisations at this point in time. You will see that call is there in the middle. Um, and in fact, um, it is one of the founding members. So 
I think that's great work, um, cool. But you can see all the other groups in there. Um, we're trying to increase our global reach. Um, so, but we've got most continents there are covered, but not quite all. So we're still a work in progress. And I just want to thank um, also all the people on the board for their expertise and their time. So um, a few years ago, uh, SCOS, we did some work on strategy. The point there was to look at what we're aiming to do is actually viable and is going to work. Um, we did, we put a lot of work into that strategy. Um, it's a three year strategy that we're in the middle of now. So um, you can see the vision and mission there. Um, we really want to have a world uh, where there's a thriving ecosystem of open science infrastructure. Um, and our mission um, is to do all the connections between the stakeholders to help make that happen. Uh, we have three goals um, which are listed in the strategic uh, plan. Um, one is around uh, to promote a sustainability uh, through funding and support. Um, the next one is awareness raising uh, through advocacy and connection. Um, and then also, um, we also want to do the vetting and selection process so that there's a trusted mechanism for you to work with. If you've got time, um, I'd like to encourage you to have a look at the strategy document. Um, so we have grown uh, the number of institutions um, which are providing funding. Uh, we're well over 300 now, which is really, really great to see. Uh, there's a growing number of countries over 24. Um, most rounds, uh, we support up to three infrastructure, but uh, we had the pilot with only two. Um, and we've done really well on funding actually, now that we're well over 5 million euros. Um, and of course that money goes, it goes from the consortia or the institution uh, to the institution. Uh, t -t 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 it goes to then the infrastructure direct and it doesn't go via Spark Europe um, or SCOS. Um, I will let you know that Spark Europe takes a very small fee to help administer and to provide the service to the infrastructure, um, but it's very small. So just in summary, I'm just gonna skip through these slides um, just to give you an overview of the pilot cycle um, with these two infrastructure, so Peromeo DOAJ. You can see their targets. Uh, you can see DOAJ um, reached its target and in fact was invited uh, to create a second work plan and reach its target. Um, three years on, we haven't reached the target for Sherpa Romeo, but they have also reached a substantial amount of funding to improve sustainability. In the second uh, cycle, uh, we're working with DOAB and OAPEN and, um, and also like them with open citations and then with PKP. Um, you can see their targets there um, and they're variously reaching those um, now, which is good. Uh, you can still support those. Third site funding cycle, Archive, Amelica, and also DSpace. Um, they've been uh, also open uh, for funding for a little while now and they're variously reaching their targets, but still need more funding. Um, most people probably know what Archive is. Um, uh, if you don't know about Amelica, um, that's a diamond open access system, uh, which started off with South America um, and also like the Spanish and Hispanic speaking areas. And then there is our DSpace, the repository. Now this is the fourth funding cycle, which is the newest one. So following our vetting process, um, we chose three infrastructure, uh, first one is working like that with Dryad, um, which, which is also a data repository system uh, to normalize uh, the availability uh, of open access data through publishing. They have a target of 889 euros. Um, it was only released at the end of the last year, so the target hasn't been reached, of course, so only like at 8%. Um, the next one is working like that with La Referencia. Um, uh, so that's an indexing system for open access journals, also from South America and our Spanish speaking um, regions. Um, and that's got a smaller target of 268 euros. 
and they've reached around a 14% at this time. The next one is RAW. Um, it, that's a registry of identifiers for organizations. They've got a 989,000 um, target and they've already reached over 20%, which is um, amazing. So I'll spend a little bit more time on, on each of these just to explain them um, and ask that uh, you consider making some of your funding available um, to them. I might just say that um, working with calls is really important. Um, it really works well for the, this to work uh, with other consortia um, of libraries rather than with each individual institution. Um, because the invo because other, you see, because the infrastructure do the invoicing, um, it makes it a lot easier for them. They don't have to put um, um, as much of their energy into that. Um, also, we rely on the consortia um, to help uh, with explaining, having webinars like this to answer questions um, as well. And of course, working with consortia, um, there can be a discount um, if there's a number of members if they're like um, a 10 or more um, who are giving to one infrastructure. Um, we've also been working um, with the infrastructure to, to provide some options um, that you can pay as a donation, as a subscription or as like a membership. Um, and that has different meanings in different parts of the world to some degree. Um, so we provide those options as well. Um, and so that may be helpful to you. So some things that we can do um, as owners and creators of open science, um, we work with the family of SCOS infrastructure. Uh, we work with them uh, to promote governance, uh, standards. Um, we actually bring them together uh, to share experiences and answer questions. Um, and um, yeah, we just sort of help them through the whole process. It's not just about funding and we help them to do an application as well. Um, us working in universities, uh, we can work individually or collectively. Um, also, it helps to support our governance, um, helps to support open science, open standards, open source. Um, it helps with uh, the capacity building. And I'd like to ask each of you to think about how in your organisation, what the funding might be available that you could make to one or more of those infrastructure whether they're the round four infrastructure or the previous, I know call will still take funds for the previous rounds, all of them. Um, and also think about what might be the mechanism at your university for doing that to get approval. So let's look at Dryad. Um, it's been around for quite a while, already quite well known, I would think. Um, it's there to support the availability and reuse of research data. Um, at the bottom of this slide, you can see a link to the flyer that we have from SCOS and it's the pitch from uh, the infrastructure. Um, so um, in their pitch, they're talking about um, they need to increase capacity uh, to work with users in an engagement strategy in particular um, and to growth. Um, so I think for them, it's a scalability issue that they're trying to address um, in their excellent work. I've got a little bit of indicators here of usage. You can see um, the usage of a few countries in terms of, in terms of written here as percentage of total data sets. Um, so Australia is running at a little over 5% and New Zealand is running at just under 1% of global data sets. So, um, and there's a large number of visitors uh, also to Data Dryad uh, from New Zealand and Australia in 18 months. Um, so those, are, we're just using those um, as some evidence um, of usage. Hmm. Uh, they also have a membership Dryad as well. And there are some universities and institutions that are already members of Dryad because they've chosen uh, to subscribe and to take advantage of the premium services. That includes my institution. Um, so, you know, you can think about, I think the value that you get uh, through a SCOS uh, membership rather than it, 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 through a Dryad. Um, it's, 
it's normally lower cost, but of course it depends on what services that, that you're wanting. Um, at my institution, um, we try to support um, we we try to support I mean, all the SCOS infrastructure, but there are some instances where we have a membership to the infrastructure. So we're careful to only pay one way or the other, um, and that would be up to you and your choice. La referencia. Um, so um, it, this one here is a repository network um, in South America. Um, it's been going now for more than 10 years. Um, it's, it's very successful. Um, it's also got a flyer down here um, as well that you can click on. When you go to the page on the SCOS website, which has round four listed, um, you can also watch a video from each infrastructure about their pitch. So you might want to have a look at those videos as well as the flyers. Um, so there's a few members there um, of the network. So um, it works as an aggregator um, service, uh, pulling in content from a variety of places. Um, uh, it also, um, they're trying to do some work in, as you can see in their flyer, um, to increase the use of, of the identifiers and also to provide a usage uh, statistics service across a broader range of content than they have been using before. Ooh, I go back one actually. Um, one of the growth areas also for La Referencia is that starting off in South America and then um, they're also moving to the African content um, to provide uh, also their services and infrastructure to African institutions. That has a lot of potential. Um, you know, it's a diverse, uh, uh, it's sort of like a diverse space. So they're looking for funding um, to help do that. RAW, um, so it's a registry of open and persistent identifiers for research organizations. Um, they have a flyer um, as well. Um, they're wanting to shore up their infrastructure um, and to increase engagement um, around the world. Here's some evidence of usage. Uh, there are over 1400 Australian organizations um, already using that they've provided um, list of, and you can see the types there, including libraries. Uh, and then for New Zealand, there are over 270 organisations using, um, including libraries um, as well. So here's a, just a bit more information about RAW. Um, it's included in, in also the persistent identifier uh, policy by ARDC, it's essential to FAIR. Um, it's, it also works with ORCID, um, it's included in RAID metadata, and it's um, also inclusion also of research facilities. So that's the uh, end of my slide. So I'm going to stop sharing. Um, and let's see if we, uh, and then I'll move over uh, then back to Angus, I think. Yep, thanks very much for that, Martin. That was that was great. I posted in the chat the link to um, the, this round of funding on, on the SCOS website. Um, but we'll come back to questions for you at the end. Um, Angus, over to you. Thanks, Ginny. I'll just share my screen. There we go, that should be working now. Hopefully everyone can see that. Um, thank you, Martin. Thank you, Ginny, for the opportunity to um, join in this conversation and talk about calls involvement with SCOS. Um, we see this as a, a, a very important um, aspect of open access to support. So what I'll do is over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk about a little bit more about why um, we think it's so important and why we're so keen um, to support these projects. Now I'll, I'll talk a bit about some of the practicalities about how the pledge, pledges can be made. So a little bit about the how and the when. Um, so 
Uh, as Martin said, um, Call and, and SCOS have been working together in terms of facilitating uh, pledges in this region uh, for the Call membership since 2018. Um, and, and we see this really as a, a vital part um, of open access. Now that we have 21 open access agreements um, with, with publishers large and small, uh, a, a very important element um, in terms of the ecosystem is the infrastructure uh, that underlies um, many of the workflows, um, um, uh, much of the data um, that supports open access. And I think um, um, from our perspective, um, we, we very much see that um, alternatives for commercial offerings are, are very much required. Um, we've seen that some of the projects are extremely innovative uh, and actually fill in the gaps where commercial providers either haven't paid enough attention or, or, or perhaps don't see there being enough commercial benefit uh, in providing services. Um, so it's really important that the, these projects um, exist and, and fill those gaps. Uh, and certainly, you know, work from the belief that um, if, if the research um, is open, um, certainly the infrastructure needs to, that supports metadata and citations needs to be open as well. I think one of the best examples that we've seen um, just recently, and it, it's had a you know quite a practical implication for us at call, um, is with ROR and uh, identifiers. Um, so as we work more and more with um, some of the agree agreements, having to really very carefully identify um, who is what at what institution and and who they are affiliated to, in terms of their uh, uh, approving their article for open access. Um, having um, a, an agreed set of identifiers for the institution uh, and unique identifiers is a very important part of that approval process. Um, ROR being um, one of these projects that Martin spoke about um, has its data open. So call can actually see the ROR, identif ROR identifier uh, and that's very, very helpful for us um, when we're making sure that um, institutions are correctly set up with the right identifiers. Some of the publishers use ROR. I think Spring and Nature, uh, just off the top of my head, is one of them. Uh, however, many of the publishers use um, commercial identifier services. And we're actually locked out um, from seeing the data, seeing the actual identifiers, and, and particularly seeing the, the, the sub um, institutions uh, as well, which can be very difficult when we, you consider all the, the hospitals and, and other affiliated research institutions that are linked to universities. So that's a really um, good, I think, example or, um, or case in point uh, as to why we should support these sorts of, sorts of services which are open uh, just as much as the, the research itself is open. So um, in terms of some of the practicalities and, and some of the arrangements. As Martin said, we've been involved since 2018. Um, we've had, I just checked the numbers uh, last night, uh, since 2018, there's been over $500,000 in pledges from call members uh, to SCOS projects. Uh, and the workflow is very much, um, as you see here, um, we work th um, through Consortium Manager, that's our, our CRM system for managing all of our consortial agreements, uh, and we also manage the um, pledges as well. So for the um, staff in libraries who uh, manage procurement uh, and facilitate um, these payments typically, um, managing the pledges through consortium managers is, is obviously the best way to do it because everyone's familiar with the system. Uh, and then I think the other benefit that we provide here is that we consolidate the invoicing uh, on behalf of the projects, uh, which makes it far more convenient for the institutions because they don't need to go and set up a new payer uh, or pay in each of their um, systems or for every single project. Um, and what we do is we invoice directly on behalf of, of the projects uh, and then we channel the money back to the projects. Uh, and in that way, it's a, it's a direct um, invoice and payment. Uh, again, it doesn't go through SCOS, it um, all goes directly via call um, from each project to the members. So basically, we list the projects in Consortium Manager, um, member institutions confirm the pledges there, um, we invoice uh, the members and then we make that payment back to the projects. 
Uh, as Martin said, the um, figures um, for institutions are 4,000 for a large institution or 2,000 for a small institution. If we get 10 or more institutions pledging to a specific project um, in a year, we will do a, there will be a 25% discount um, associated with that. Um, we're encouraging institutions to think of this as a three-year commitment. Um, so um, there are funding rounds, but there are yearly commitments as well. Um, and again, members are welcome to pledge any amount, large or small, um, for any of the project rounds from $500 upwards. Um, just email us um, with what you'd like to pledge uh, and to which projects, and we'll make the necessary adjustments in Consortium Manager ready for you to confirm. Um, that's a very straightforward process, and I know that many members have, have done that. Um, and members are welcome to pledge to any of the current projects or any of the previous projects. And one thing that we introduced last year, which we will repeat again this year, um, is in addition to the current pledges for which we need confirmations by the middle of the year, by 30th of June, uh, December at the end of this year, we'll, we will bring up another uh, agreement page in Consortium Manager listing all of the projects so that if members, um, if any institutions are, are fortunate enough, um, to have a little bit uh, left over in their budgets and they want to quickly expend that uh, and need an invoice very quickly, as sometimes happens, um, we will have a page in Consortium Manager where, where members can sort of confirm those pledges as well. And that, I, I thought, worked quite well last year and we'll, we'll certainly repeat that um, this year and I expect in coming years. So um, what we have at the moment, um, we've, we've just set, finished setting up the agreement pages in Consortium Manager. Um, one difference that um, uh, procurement uh, staff on the call here might notice is that we've actually gone ahead and set up the um, agreement pages for following years. So um, we've done that already uh, for the next three years and you're, you're welcome to confirm for, for next year or, or 2025 if you're, you're thinking that far ahead. Um, if you're... Um, not able to access Consortium Manager or, or not active, actively involved in procurement, um, but are able to support um, your colleagues at your institution with making the pledges, P please speak to the content coordinator um, at your institution uh, to assist with that. Um, and in terms of some further detail in Consortium Manager, um, just to reiterate, each funding cycle now has its own agreement page. Um, procurement staff might notice that as a difference this year. We've sort of rationalised things a little bit to, to, to more closely mirror the way that, that SCOS works. Uh, I think previously we'd, we'd set up a different agreement uh, for each um, individual project. We've, we've I, I think, created some efficiencies by bringing those together on the one uh, agreement, the, uh, the three projects into one agreement there in Consortium Manager. Uh, and um, we are asking that uh, everyone makes their pledges um, by the 30th of June, because at that point we'll commence our uh, invoicing processes. And then just a, a couple of slides in terms of some of the practicalities. Um, for the staff accessing um, uh, consortium manager, you will find the uh, agreements very easily. Uh, what we've done is we've just put up an announcement. So as soon as you log in, um, you'll see under the notifications there uh, that there are links. There's a, a message with links to the um, fourth round uh, funding projects. Also, the third round funding projects, if you'd like to continue to uh, make pledges to those previous rounds, third and second rounds, um, they are all there. Uh, in Consortium Manager ready for you to make those pledges as well. Uh, and just another little practical tip for those in Consortium Manager. Um, if you do have any trouble finding them, just simply click View in Catalog, um, do a search uh, on SCOS, you'll find them, um, click View in Catalog, and then you'll be able to quickly add those uh, to the shopping cart. Sometimes the new offers are a little bit harder to find than the renewal offers. Um, just remember, once you've found it and you want to order, click on that viewing catalogue button and then uh, add it to the shopping cart. So that's pretty much everything that I wanted to cover. Uh, and I'll stop sharing there and I think we'll open things up back up for questions. Is that right, Ginny? Yep. 
Thank you very much, Angus. That's really that's really clear. Um, I, so, I mean, just to say thank you to um, to Call for facilitating it. It's really great to see that it you know it's it's easy to now support these infrastructure. And I, I, I like the idea, of particularly of being able to open it up at the end of the year. As you say, that is often a time when there is a bit of money that people are kind of able to kind of spend on it. Um, I also thought it was just really good to hear from Martin about the practical support that you provide that SCOS provides to the infrastructures. I think that's a you know a really interesting sounds like a, a great service that they get. Um, I was I had a couple of questions I was going to ask, but just to remind everyone, you can put your questions in the chat and we can we can we'll come to those. Um, I was really interested, Martin, in particular that um, you know there are now. Um, uh, uh, resources such as Amelica and Lever Referencia from from outside of the kind of the, the I guess the developed world and uh, could you just reflect a bit on how they came to be supported because they've obviously been going for quite some time and is this an attempt do you think to also have get content from outside of the um, you know from Latin America and, and the areas that they serve? Mm. So I think there's multiple parts to that. Um, SCOS wants to be global, working with each region of, of the world. It's very important for us um, to support a diversity of research, um, also in terms of a geography and language and subject areas. Um, so also, also the South American infrastructure have been going for quite a long time and they're very uh, well developed, um, but they haven't really been funded um, in some cases as well as they need. So they've put in um, also proposals. Um, so we're really, really happy to support them. Um, in some ways, in some ways, I think they're role models for that kind of infrastructure to other parts of the world. So to help extend them to other regions of the world, I think is a really good thing to do. Yeah. Yeah, I, I agree. I think it's, a, it's really great to see that. Um, I was going to ask, so this is rather a practical question. So I know that we've got people on this call who are um, probably not member of, members of the core consortia. So if people want to, if their organisations want to support SCOS and they're not part of CORE, what, what's the process that um, they should be going through at this point? Yeah, so they could contact me or they could contact Spark Europe or the infrastructure and then we will facilitate something. Okay. Great, thank you. Um, so a question from David Gonawagan, um, which is like, do you, which is, uh, do you think that any of the services that, that didn't get to 100% are at risk of closing? And maybe I could just add to that a, a thought that I had, which is, do you have any sense of the um, the services that, you know, what why some of the services get more support than others? Mm. Um, so that's interesting questions. And thank you for those questions. Um, we work with the infrastructure to have a diversity. Um, also of approaches um, to their funding models. So when we're talking about sustainability, we're not just talking about our finding them funding, we're also talking about them building governance models and engagement models to have other pathways for funding. Um, well, when we started um, SCOS, we wanted to just do a three year of support, but we found actually there was quite a lot of support continuing into the fourth year. So we've actually, you know, we've actually left them open, even though we're not actively working with them as strongly as with the current. Um, so I, I guess that's a change um, in our strategy, just leaving them um, open um, as well. Um, I, think, <clears throat> I, think, I think for those that have not reached, um, I think the target, um, it will impact them to complete their full work plan for sure, unless they find um, another source um, of funding, definitely. And there was a follow-up question there, Ginny, that I liked, but it's it's just getting my mind. Uh, it was about, you know, if you have a sense of which um, services, why that why some get well funded, funded and easily funded, and other, as others of them don't. Do you think it's a lack of under people's understanding of what the services they provide, or or, or what what do you think the issue is? Yeah, I, I think it, I don't think it's necessarily the same reasons for all the infrastructure. Um, I think. Some have already have already developed an engagement strategy and a membership model even before they came to SCOS. Um, some developed a membership model while they're partnering with SCOS, and that's okay. And some have been more or less as successful. Um, 
we provide tools to the infrastructure to help them to do promotion. And some have invested more um, in engagement and promotion than others. While Spark Europe also provides a level of service for it. But the ones that have done really well um, have been really good at engaging the potential users as well. Yeah, I think so. Um, also, I think that a geography plays into it um, as well, um, and perhaps language um, as well. So those issues. Mm. Yeah, that's that's those are really good um, points. Um, Angus, could I ask you a question? You you mentioned in your um, your presentation about encouraging uh, members to support over more than one year, and I, I wondered if you could perhaps just reflect on you know what percentage of um, the bids, the the kind of support that comes in is just for one year and when it's when it's for more and, and how that how important that is and perhaps in supporting these infrastructures um it's I, I think it's you know going back to the broad discussion about sustainability for these infrastructures it's really important uh, i guess what we're wanting to try and do is to encourage um libraries to almost think of these like subscriptions in that we, we do it's it's not just a single year subscription is we we need to just factor in the, the payment for these in subsequent years as well uh, and have that uh, a bit of a mindset that this is a, a recurring cost a little bit sort of like the other subscriptions where possible Look, um, but we do know you know um, obviously institutions have budget challenges and um, that's not always possible um, uh, and we do say look we're, we're always happy to facilitate sort of any amount for any project at, at any time um, as well um, so that's that but that's a bit of the I suppose the rationale but behind sort of putting in the additional sort of um, agreement pages for the subsequent years. Um, and I suppose a practical um, perspective from a, uh, from callers that it's uh, it's easy for us to do it now than to have to go and repeat it each each year. Um, so we've done the work now for the next um, uh, few years, which is good. Uh, but um, to the earlier part of your question, Ginny, um, it's hard to say you know, what the uh, uh, recurring uh, subscriptions are it, it because it is it is extremely variable I'd, I'd have to go away and spend a bit of time just sort of doing that analysis um, so um, and I think that just reflects that institutions do genuinely you know when they have the opportunity when they have have the, the budget spared you know do like to support these um, projects so the, so the message is definitely you know um, get in your repeats um, subscription so that this it helps saves everyone time and and effort at the end and as you say I think this idea of the um, the kind of idea that uh, the infrastructures then have some um, view to the future of what their funding is going to be is incredibly important for completing the work as Martin said um, Martin, can I just ask you a question about whether or not you think there are um, any uh, infrastructure services that are coming from Australia or Outer in New Zealand that might be, you know, that are, have ever have come to you? Are there any that you see on the horizon? Um, and what, what, may, what might be the opportunities if, if um, uh, infrastructure organisations are thinking about um, um, kind of coming to you for funding? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've really sort of worked on the process of application um, um, and assessment. We also um, work uh, with the infrastructure on their proposal and provide advice as well. So, you know, they're not on their own, even when they're doing it, you know, even when they're doing at the proposal stage. Um, and the forms that we've created have been refined over time. So I actually think that they're quite good and they ask the right questions. Um, we do have some requirements um, that the infrastructure which is proposed um, is at least of a regional, you know, sort of usage or benefit. Um, and usually that also, um, it also supports more than a subject area. You know, they, there's a lot of subject specific infrastructure, um, which is great and they're very needed, of course. But at the moment, while we're in the opening years still of SCOS, um, we were, I guess that we were focusing um, on uh, the multi-subject infrastructure at this time. Um, so we encourage applications from Australia and like, and also from New Zealand, um, of course. Um, it's very important that in the proposal, the infrastructure also states why they have a sustainability problem um, and how SCOS can help with their sustainability problem. That's really, really important. 
Yeah, I, th I think you've made a really good case for, um, you know, both on the website and also in, in talks, indicate these, these are not emerging um, areas of infrastructure. This, these are uh, infrastructure that's actually already important right now for the open open access and open research system. So it, it, there is a kind of need to see these supported long term. Yeah, um, I just will make one other comment related to that. Um, what you're seeing in the rounds um, are the infrastructure which have been right through the process and which we've chosen to support in a round. We feel that we can only support up to three in, in each round. So that's really why we're limiting to three. But, you know, there can be a much broader range of infrastructure involved at some point. Um, but we keep that a confidential process um, yeah, until we go live. Um, with the round. Yeah. yeah. So sorry. What? So another, just another thought, I guess, is: Do you, are there any areas where you think, Martin, we're really missing infrastructure? I guess I'd be interested in your thoughts for this as well. Are there kind of ob obvious areas where there is no infrastructure supporting a particular um, area of open science that you, you know, you would like to be seeing in the future? Um, we've looked at that in the strategy. We've done some mapping of open science, open access infrastructure by type. Um, so. Um, we've addressed some of those, like, uh, for example, um, we've added identifiers, we've also added infrastructure for data. So we're working through that, but it also, you know, relies um, on us having applications. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think just sort of reflecting on where we've come from and where we're going, um, we still have a gap in Asia around representation on the board. Um, working with infrastructure also, um, which is like a from Asia and which is aimed at Asia as well. So um, that would be um, a gap that we might look to try to address. And just to add my pennies on uh, on where there might be some gaps, certainly that there's no upper limit in terms of the amount of analytics that can be done um, on open access publishing. I, I think one of the the challenges around that th that we have and I'd, something i'd love to see a project on is is um something that addresses the problem that there's no standard um for reporting um in publishing uh and and that's certainly one of our biggest issues in terms of bringing in data from publishers and ingesting it into a, a homogenized platform like uh, or homogenized display in a platform like tableau is that we have to do an awful lot of work to get the data into the right formats and, and order in order to be able to present it um, in a uniform way. So um, that would be what my number one vote if uh, if there was a project that was going to address um, uniformity in publishing reporting. Great, thank you for that. That was uh, that's really interesting. I so said maybe there's somebody in the in on the call who kind of can we think you're working on that. Um, so I think I think we will we'll come to the end of this. We're almost at the hour. Um, if there's an, is there anything you'd like to just say before we end? Um, otherwise, then I will just do a bit of a plug for our next next webinar. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's right. So, um, have a break. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Angus. Thank you, Martin. I, I, I just think I'd just like to highlight for everybody. This is such a you know an important and really inspirational kind of community driven and led um, initiative to support the open infrastructure that we really need to see in open science. So I, I think um, the, the work that SCOS has done has been absolutely amazing. It's kind of really putting the money where it's needed. And, um, you know, the work that Paul has done to facilitate that happening and being right at the front of leading it again has just been really important. The, you know, sometimes it's hard for Australia and New Zealand institutions to get involved, but I think that, you know, as you said, you know, we've been right at the front of it through the work that you and that uh, you and call have done so thank you for that and yeah everybody needs to go advocating to their um to the people that hold the budgets at this point so we That's and right. remind us again martin the the, the or uh, angus the funding uh, when the pledges need to be in for this round um, 30th of june is what we've put the the deadline in uh, so that gives everyone i think a bit of time to to work on this um, we have a deadline because um, we need to collect all of the the um, indications to pledge from the members so that we can then start the invoicing process uh, it, it becomes a little bit difficult um, if we have to start working um, with sort of um, individual so it just just helps us to be a little bit more efficient if we can if we've got all of the commitments by then um so 
uh, certainly more efficient in terms of consolidating the, the, the processing. Great, thank you. Um, so just to remind everyone, we'll put this up on our website, the recording. Um, you can con co you can con you can contact Angus or Martin for further information. Um, and just to say, our next uh, uh, webinar will be on the fourth of May, and it's on the ebook SOS, uh, which we're really looking forward to um, hearing about. So thank you, Angus. Thank you, Martin, and um, happy Easter to everybody. Thanks. Thank you, Ginny, and thank you, Angus, and thank you, Thanks, Yeah, thank you very much. Bye. Bye.